So my name is Patrick Lundblad. I just arrived from Sweden yesterday evening, so I'm slightly tired, if you don't notice that. I have a PhD in visualization. So before I actually start, I want to know who you are, because this is my second time to Boston. How many people of you are academics? Couple. How many of you are incubators, small startups? How many of you are in larger companies? What are the rest? <laughs> so I've actually been in academics for five years in my PhD, mostly around applied research, looking at how you can take visualization, apply it to real life data, and make use of it. Together with a professor and some other PhD students, I created a spin-off company. We did statistics visualization for IMF, Eurostat, European Region, European Space Agency, a couple of other organizations. And then we were acquired, we decided that, yeah, let's focus even more on visualization and work with another company around it. So now I'm a part of a bigger company and just learning how that life is. So I'm actually going to talk to you about some concepts. I know you had some introduction to data visualization yesterday, so I'm not going to dig too deep into the basics, but I want to focus on four areas that I really like. But before that, how many of you have seen this one before? Most of you, I know Tufti is here, talks sometimes to you. This is Minard 869. This is early data visualization, not even data. This is about Napoleon having his army over here with 400,000 soldiers, wanting to reach Moscow with 100,000 soldiers, failing to do this, and then retreating with his army back arriving back to Lithuania with 4,000 soldiers. So you can read the entire book about this. There's actually a new one out recently. But this is all about comparing 400,000 soldiers to 4,000 soldiers. It's about two data sets of his army marching towards Moscow and back from Moscow. It's about the temperature, minus 30, some French scale, which is around minus 30 degrees, 30, 40 Fahrenheit, and so on. So really already back in 869, we knew how to visualize data. Going forward from then, we actually know why we can visualize data. So I'm going to show you a couple of numbers. And I want you to raise your hand as soon as you see number three among these numbers. Almost everyone is on the game. So if I do this again, can you raise your hand when you see number three? And that was quite a bit easier. Do you know why? It's color. So we have something called visual perception. We like to divide this into three stages. The first, second, and the third stage. The first stage is all about neurons. We can detect edges, color, texture, movements. The second part is more of pattern, contours, motion. And then the third part here is about us actually thinking about and seeing and trying to interpret data. So the first stage is really great because we have what's called pre-attentive processing. If we look at something and it stands out to you in less than 250 milliseconds, it's pre-attentive. Your eyes are immediately focused to the things that stands out to you. May it be color, may it be shape, may it be orientation, size, or even clusters. Your eyes are drawn to that area immediately and you start analyzing. So all of these things have been documented, 1980s, 1990s. You can read about them and how to use them. You got pattern perception. This is the second stage. You can immediately look at this scatter plot here and see the clusters, how they are divided. You can also look at this line chart here and see there's a missing area in there. But your mind doesn't care about that. You're automatically creating a line that connects to this one here. So you're looking for contours, patterns, motions, and so on. And then you got the third stage, which is when you actually start looking at these scatter plots individually, loading one of them into a chunk in your memory, and then comparing that chunk with another chunk to see what's the difference between them. But this is purely academic. I actually like talking about how you can use it. So this is one of the most popular car renting places in England. This is Lynx Cars. She was actually at the Dragon Den. And she actually has 100,000 customers. But imagine going to this website, and if you actually look at the real one, 
it has flash animations all over it. There's this person up here dancing and walking around and colors and all those. So what are you looking at? You have no idea. <laughs> but let's do it in a reality. I mean, if you have a table, this is Excel. You want to style it. You want to make it look beautiful. But the color up here doesn't stand out. It's hard to read the numbers. They're uneven and so on. If you use the perception rules that I just told you, you immediately see that Macho Man Randy Savage stands out as being something important because the red stands out against the background. The second part here, I actually don't need to repeat all these names here because automatically you're creating groupings here because there's space in between here. So you know that these three names goes to Jobber, the unknown. And then the third phase, you're looking at the numbers. I'm using a common domination of thousands, and I'm using ratio. You're comparing them to each other. So that's just how using visual perception rules and making something harder to analyze to making it easier to analyze. Because I know exactly how a person looks at this chart, table, and how they analyze it. Another thing that's really interesting is color. So eighth grade science, biology, I guess you all know how an eye works. You have light coming in, you have cones, you have rods. Interesting enough, we actually have 125 million rods in average. We only have 7 million cones. So we're actually perceiving you much more than we're perceiving color. And as an example, let's do a quiz. This is the birth dates in a country by month and day. And the darker is, the more common a person is born on that date. And the lighter, the less common. Can you identify the country? Everyone says Sweden. That's, that's the context that I'm from Sweden. So it's not Sweden, actually. It's the US. And why? What happens 4th of July? Independence Day. So you are all out celebrating. You don't want to have a planned birth on the 4th of July meaning that you schedule that planned birth for two days later or the day before. People are still born on 4th of July, and congratulations to them, but you don't plan a baby to be born on that day. Same thing, Thanksgiving. You don't want to have children during Thanksgiving or Christmas. This probably is most countries here, but 4th of July is one thing that stands out to me that I can analyze this data set with. When it comes to color, we divide the cones into the red U, the green U, the blue U. And I'm not saying that you're seeing blue less, just that because you have less of these, because we probably inside our mind have a blue color magnifier that magnifies the blue color. But what's interesting is if you look at the Flavia, the Fovia, if you are a person who have no colorblind deficiency, this is what it looks like. The red receptors, the green receptors, the blue receptors, if you're colorblind instead, you have this instead. You're not actually seeing the difference between green and red. You're still perceiving red, but it goes through the green channel. So quick and easy test. What's on the left side? Which number? 16. Everyone can see number 16. What's in the middle? Seven. Most people can see number 7. Some people can't see anything. What's on the right side? Three. Did anyone say 3? So if you see three, you have a slight efficiency towards colorblindness. So I mean, this is a really great way of knowing what people can see or not. And I really like to talk about color, but I don't have all the time here. So I'll just recommend colorbrewer2.org. You can go in there. You can specify what kind of color scale you like. You want to use U. You want to use divergent. You want to use qualitative colors. And it will actually tell you which ones are colorblind friendly, LCD monitor friendly, VGA projector friendly, print friendly, and so on. And as long as I've been doing visualizations, I've always been complimented about my charts looking so good. This is a secret, because I have good looking color scales. So how can you use data? How can you use colors? Quite often. People put this in, and this is the rainbow syndrome. A chart is boring. Let's add color to it. 
you perceptually look at this red bar being higher than this blue bar because it's more intense to you. It actually stands out. If you scale away the color, you can immediately see which bar is higher, which bar is lower. If you use a sequential one, you can see what's higher, what's not as important. Diverging, this is often temperature scales above, below a certain value. You can see something is above or below. Or, my favorite, the skills. I actually have product sales here, and I have categorized them what, by what category they are. So this is just like Skittles. I take up a blue Skittle. I know what it's going to taste like. It's going to taste exactly the same as every other blue Skittles in the package. So you can see here, best-selling products, menswear, then female, and babywear is more in the middle. So same you saw in the presentation, two presentations ago, what class do we belong to? Easy to see. And this isn't really news. This is 1980s research and forward. So you can find these books and other books that have really great topics around this. But let's talk about some of the more modern concepts, that of animation. If you look at this picture here, this is a tapestry all kind of on my grandmother's place. Is there anything in this picture that stands out to you? Someone actually screamed, best reaction this week. <laughs> so we are really good. So this is the first part. We are really good at seeing transitions, animation, and so on. They stand out to us. But how many haven't seen this on the left side with Hans Rosling telling you, look at China here, look at the population. It's actually growing until Mao Zedong comes in and people start dying. That's great because he's up there, he's telling you what to watch. But the animation here mainly tells you the overall movement. If I ask you to follow this blue bubble here, can you do it for me? Have you lost it? You lost it because this is exactly the same thing birds use in nature. They fly together in a flock, constantly moving around each other because they need to be safe. If a predator is outside there looking at one of these birds, it makes a U-turn, it goes behind another bird, it just goes in a direction you didn't expect, you lose it. So if you have bad results anytime or anything, just animate it because no one will ever be able to find you among everyone else. <laughs> Unless you go across the stream, because you need to follow that movement. But animation can still be good. I like animations when it comes to transitions. I can see how a bubble changes as I do selections. So instead of just having bubbles disappearing, appearing, I can tell you how does a bubble move from one state to another. And we are not hard implementing this. Already back in 1930s, Disney were doing transitions. So this is, for example, slow in, slow out. This is transition I want to use when I have an axis changing scale. So in the beginning, I'm changing the axis scale slowly, and I'm speeding up until I reach the middle. Then I decelerate and go slowly in the end. That way I get a much smoother transition than just having a linear transition all the way through. So good paper back from the 1930s around how to do animation. Focus and context. This is another deep dive. You see I'm all over the place when it comes to visualization right now. You've all seen this one before. Moore's Law or so. 128 megabytes, 128 gigabytes just nine years in between. So we all know we're getting more and more data. But my question to you is, in this time between 2005 and 2014, by how many times has your screen resolution increased? Has it increased by one million or not? It's increased maybe by four to ten times at the most. And it might actually even have decreased because you're now sitting on a smartphone that is less resolution than you had before. But still, we have larger data sets, we want to visualize it, but we don't have the screen resolution for it. Hence, we're, for example, using tree maps. This is 100,000 data points to visualize all that data together on this small screen. Or you can use one of the contexts that come from information visualization. If you ever take a class with Ben Snyder or someone, he's going to have you for one hour stand up and repeat, overview first, zoom and filter, data's on demand. 
because that's how we work in information visualization. Visual analytics, kind of different, but still same. Analyze first, show the important, zoom, filter and analyze further, details on demand. What this tells us is that if we can show the user an overview of the data, then it can dig down into details. And there are many ways of doing this. For example, you can use trellising, small multiples, and so on. So this is a data set with six variables. Instead of having a scatter plot and comparing them one at a time, I can do a trellising and see the overview of the data. What are all the possible combinations? Such as you had the iris data set, you can do the same thing here. We can see immediately which ones stands out against each other visually. Or you can do a fisheye lens. So this is a billboard up here. I have a small part of the billboard I'm focusing on. Let's say I take uh, yeah, two pencils. I put the billboard here. I can actually then focus on it and see the context. Let's see, I skip this one. So what it actually ends up with is, for example, if you have a bar chart, you have a few bars that you want to focus on. You can put a focus in here in the middle, a certain amount of bars. You have the details about who they are, what numbers they have, and exact values that you can measure. But you can still have a context on the side with those other one hundredths of bars that wouldn't fit on a screen normally. And if you add interactivity to it, it's easy to scroll through a data set of thousands of bars and always see where are those bars related to each other. So just a simple fisheye technique applied to a bar chart. Or overview and details. This is 10,000 zip codes of Sweden. If I would render every zip code on this map here, some of them would be smaller than one pixel, or they would overlap each other if I had the borders and so on. So in here on the left side, I'm just using a heat map. So for each pixel, I'm looking at what's the value in below there, the average value. And then I have a details view here telling me exactly the zip codes. And even down here in the city, I can zoom in and see to a street level what are the values, but still knowing where I am. Something, third area, responsive visualizations. So we're all used to watching a visualization on a projector, 1024, 128, or something like that. What happens when you take a visualization to an Android device? This is the amount of devices available for Android. And this is amount, how many people have a certain device. So if I'm going to design a visualization and it's going to be able to use on a mobile, I need to know what mobile are they using it on. So I need to maybe program and adapt to all of these ones. Or I can do another thing. I can look at the screen resolution for all these mobiles. So each area here is a certain resolution. And this tells me that if I'm doing visualizations, I can't say they're going to be 400 by 400 pixels, because I have no idea if they're going to be able to display or not on certain devices. Simple. So what we do is we take something from the web called responsive design. How often have you taken up your mobile, iPad, Android tablet, or so on, and not been able to see a newspaper? Because they're using a responsive design, meaning that they're adapting their area that they have so that it fits actually on the screen. So for example, a normal website, really large, looks like this on a screen resolution, PC. It scales down to be a different area on smaller devices. They're probably not getting as much detail in the end. And you can do the same things with visualizations. This is a dashboard with a couple of visualizations. So if I'm looking at this on a smaller device, I can simply use responsive design and say, I want to look at one chart at a time. But I'll also show you something I think is pretty cool that we're working on which is responsive visualizations, meaning that it's not only the design and layout of the charts that are responsive, but the visualizations themselves that are responsive also. So I have created before a bar chart. Let's add this. So a bar chart normally is quite simple. I'm seeing the height of the bars. I'm seeing the days here. I have an axis here, 0 to 6. 
what happens if I start scaling? I actually have the exact space for all these bars, luckily. But what happens if I start scaling it down? So when I don't have as much space, we're of course making all the charts smaller, pixels smaller and so on, or the font size smaller. But when I reach a certain size, I introduce a mini chart down here. So I can see, see all these charts up here, but I now have a scroll bar, and on that scroll bar, I can immediately see where everything is available. So I can start scrolling around. If I make it even smaller, you can see then that I take away the dimension lab the labels here, telling you exactly what it is, and I'm then starting to just narrow it down so it always fits. So still trying to show as good visualization as possible, but having it adapt and be flexible through screen resolution. That's quite simple. You just put up a layout and you just do the responsive design within the charts. Or if you have a sheet with many charts on it, each of these charts are then res uh, respon uh, responsive, so that they show more or less depending on the screen size that they are assigned. And if you go into mobile mode, you're then viewing them one chart at a time. Last part, interaction. So, everyone knows why this is called QRT. Anyone knows why they are placed where they are? Type. So, this is a typewriter where you have these up here hitting the paper. And you don't want two of them next to each other hitting the paper at the same time because they could actually jam together. So you want to spread out the characters so that two characters used together are not next to each other up here, but still pretty close to each other. So this is from the 1900, and it's based on the English alphabet. And being a Swede with a Swedish keyboard, first of all, I've never had my Swedish keyboard jam upon me. I can tell you that. Second of all, I'm forced to use a keyboard that's based on the English language. And I know you have small differences between them, like color and color. But for anyone else who's not an English speaking, security doesn't make sense for us. It's, easy to, it's much easier for me to write in English than it is on Swedish as it goes to the speed. So what we have instead is Siri or the Google One or the, I can't remember all the names. People talk to computer and computer does hopefully what it's supposed to do. I still can't use Siri because she doesn't understand me. <laughs> or you have the mouse, as in you can actually interact with a mouse. You have this uh, hand here holding this mouse, and you have a cursor moving on the screen. Good innovation. What's even better is touch interaction. So I actually had a problem with my mother calling me last year, once per week, asking a computer problem. How do I do this in Windows? How does this work? If I take care, what happens? Control A, what do you mean? So this last Christmas, I bought her an iPad. She still calls me once per week, asking, what's the latest app you've downloaded? <laughs> Can't we play together on one of these games? Word, feud, quiz, or something like that. But she, and I mean, even a five-year-old child, you've seen those YouTube videos, can immediately use a touch interface. And I actually don't know if we have sound in here that I can connect to my computer or not. Otherwise, I'll just speak to it. So we'll see if it works or not. You're able to get an audio check. We'll see. Otherwise, I'll talk to it as it is. So we've been working, me before when I was in university, a new way of visualizing data and interacting with data. Powerful interactive visualization system. It enables museum and science center visitors to interact and explore real subjects scanned using CT and MRI technology. Inside Explorer is based on powerful interactive visualization hardware and real-time volume rendering software that unlocks the power of discovery for museum visitors and museum curators alike.
Inside Explorer is today used at museums and science centers around the world, allowing visitors to explore everything from mummies to Martian meteorites. It is easy to use and requires no training or special knowledge. By using intuitive multi-touch gestures alone, the users can investigate complex subjects that have been scanned using CT and MRI scanners. Visitors can peel away layers, rotate, zoom, and cut through subjects and reveal hidden interior details. Anything that can be scanned can be visualized, explored, and used as the basis for an interactive, authentic user experience. So that's kind of something that you hopefully will see at the museums. They have some at British Museum now and testing at other places. They're also doing virtual autopsies using this, which is, I would say, much better. But it's still something that everyone can engage in. It's much more a feeling of moving something around that's 3D, using your touch fingers on a touch device, rather than a computer, holding down control, holding down alt, depending on if you're scrolling, rotating, or zooming, and so on. So that was kind of me in a 30-minute nutshell when it comes to visualizations.